so, so I'm ready to go now. Is that okay, Kerry? Sounds good to me. Okay. Good morning. This is Boston City Councilor Ed Flynn of District 2. I represent South Boston, the South End, Chinatown, parts of Beacon Hill, Back Bay, Bay Village, um, most of the downtown area, along with Fort Point and the South Boston waterfront. Um, I'm chair of the city on city in neighborhood services. Today we are having a hearing on docket 0220, order for a hearing to discuss safety of construction sites in the city of Boston. The hearing was sponsored by myself. I am joined by my colleagues, city councilor Kenzie Bach. Um, And when other council colleagues arrive, I'll also recognize them as well. This hearing is being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov slash city council dash TV. It will be rebroadcast on Xfinity channel eight, RCN channel 82, Fios channel 964. The Zoom link to provide public testimony for this hearing can be found by emailing shane, S-H-A-N-E dot PAC, P-A-C at boston.gov. Please make sure that your Zoom handle is your full name. When you are called, please state your name and affiliation and limit your comments to two minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. If you are unable to provide testimony today, you may submit written testimony or a two minute video for our record by emailing the committee at ccc.cns at boston.gov or filling out the form on our website within 48 hours. I will first let the um, sponsor of the hearing offer brief remarks, then hand it over um, and ask my colleagues to provide an opening statement if they wish, and then I'll go right into uh, the panelists. After that, I will um, open it up to public testimony as well. Um, the invited panelists um, that are here include Dion Irish, the Commissioner of Inspectional Services, Mr. Ryle Rhodes from the New England Region Council of Carpenters, the Carpenters Union, um, and Chris English, from the, from the mayor's office. We are waiting for others, but I, I will introduce them when they, when they come. I filed this hearing order to discuss the existing safety procedures and precautions at construction sites due to tragedies, accidents, or fires in recent years that have packed workers, neighbors, and pedestrians. Even during this age of COVID, we need to make special precautions as well. In recent years, the city and the state has been experiencing unprecedented building boom with the large scale construction sites in many neighborhoods. Not here, not just here in Boston, but across the state as well. These sites have heavy machinery, cranes and equipment as well as our residents, our workforce, pedestrians, motor motorists, and cyclists who are in close proximity, proximity to the work workers as well. Construction workers are often at high risk of suffering occupational injuries and fatalities. And according to OSHA, 20% of worker fatalities were in the construction field in 2017. We have unfortunately witnessed several major accidents in recent years of injured or even killed construction workers throughout the city and state. As we are also dealing with this ongoing pandemic, we want to make sure that our construction workers are as safe as they can. It is therefore critical that we ensure that the safety of our construction workers as well as our residents and workforce. And I'd also like to acknowledge the incredible work that our construction workers have played during this pandemic 
and throughout the throughout the many years in our city, um, helping build our city, but also giving back and trying to establish apprenticeship programs in many uh, many neighborhoods. So men and women from Boston can participate in this ongoing building boom. So I want to acknowledge um, many of the construction trades that have done an exceptional job of, of, of working on that issue. At this time, I want to ask my colleagues if they would like to give a brief opening statement, starting with City Councilor Kenzie Bach. Councilor Bach. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, I'm the city councilor representing District 8, which includes Mission Hill, Fenway, Back Bay, Beacon Hill, and the West End, um, and as such have major, many major construction projects ongoing in the district. Um, and I'm really grateful to Councilor Flynn for calling this hearing today, because, you know, I think we were, we were all in a hearing together a couple weeks ago about pedestrian safety and Vision Zero, and Vision Zero, as folks may know, is a catchphrase about the importance of us making sure that there are no pedestrian fatalities in the city, um, a goal which we need to work to, together towards in policy, but which we have not reached. Um, and I really think we need to have a Vision Zero as well um, for construction safety. We should have no construction deaths in the city of Boston. And we have seen um, an unfortunate number. We had a number in 2019, um, which I know precipitated my colleague filing this. Um, and it's so important to me that everyone on all of the work sites that we see across our city is safe, um, both the workers themselves and of course anybody passing through the scene living in the area. Um, and so I'm really grateful to Councillor Flynn um, for, for calling us hearing today uh, and our ISD um, and uh, construction um, industry colleagues for being here. Uh, and, and like Councillor Flynn, I'd be remiss not to acknowledge that um, throughout the pandemic, our construction workers um, have been um, so much more. I mean, they've also been major food deliverers. They've uh, they've built the Boston Hope Hospital. Um, they've just you know been a really important part of uh, of our city response to this crisis. Um, and also, I think it's important to add that one of the reasons that we talk so often about the Boston resident jobs policy and how we can get more of our young people. Um, from Boston uh, and including our communities of color into the trades is because these are good union jobs. They're, uh, they're hardworking jobs um, that also have the opportunity to really uh, support families and, and earn a living wage. Um, and, and that's an important thing um, to all of us in the city of Boston. And so uh, I, I worked before this at the Boston Housing Authority um, and got to see firsthand what the programs like Councillor Flynn mentioned, like building pathways can do um, for for helping give access to this really important industry uh, to a wider set of folks. Um, but I'm just really grateful to, you know, the carpenters who are with us here today, uh, the Boston building trades um, and just uh, uh, this whole community. And I think it's important um, that we be making sure that we're taking as many proactive steps as we possibly can to keep everybody safe on our job sites across the city. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Bork. Um and you are exactly correct, Council Bach. Just last week, um, the Boston Building Trades um, at the Plumbers Union had a food drive for the laid off workers of um, Local 26. Those are the hotel and restaurant workers, but they provided so much food access to um, families in need. So I want to acknowledge, acknowledge that outreach effort and, and, and thank the, um, the workers of the, of the building trades. Um, we are, we're also joined by Sean Lydon, who's the Assistant Commissioner, Building Division of um, ISD. At this time, I would like to ask Commissioner Dion Irish if he would like to offer any opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Flynn, Councillor Bach. Very happy to be here. I'm, I'm not going to speak too long. I'm going to yield some of my time to Deputy Commissioner Sean Lydon, who is actually uh, our expert in this area and uh, very proud to have him on our team. But I do wanna say that I appreciate you having this hearing. I think it's important that we have this conversation publicly to talk about construction safety, to, to hear from the public, to see how we can improve and also to share what we're doing to build confidence that despite the, the, um, the, the amount of construction activity in the city that, that I think we're doing 
a jo good job of keeping the city safe, but we're always looking to do better. The mayor is very much committed to construction safety and public safety. As we all know, uh, back in 2016, when we unfortunately had an incident, um, we, the mayor quickly filed a, um, a ordinance to create the Maddox Higgins affidavit program to increase construction safety to ensure that companies who are seeking permits uh, doing work safely. And um, as we all know, recently with COVID-19, the mayor was the first in the country to um, halt construction to also make sure that construction workers were safe and the public was safe um, to, to, and to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So um, Sean will get into some more details about the things that we're doing around construction safety in general and also safety around um, COVID-19 on construction sites. So with that, uh, I'll end there and, um, and yield the rest of my time to Deputy Commissioner Sean Lighting. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. And before I introduce um, Assistant Commissioner Lighting, I just want to say thank you to um, ISD team for working so professionally during this pandemic. Um, it's been a difficult year for everybody, including the people in the construction industry. But under under your leadership, Commissioner Irish and, and, and Sean Lydon, um, you know you put a lot of good safety precautions in place. So I want to acknowledge that, and working closely with residents as well is important. Um, is important that you guys um, did that type of outreach. So I want to say thank you to uh, the ISD team. Having said that, Assistant Commissioner Lydon, uh, would you like to give opening statement? Good morning, folks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Irish. Thank you, Council. Um, basically, I would, you know, I'd like to address, you know, the construction safety in, in the city of Boston with a few, you know, a few pieces of uh, information that I've come up with. <clears throat> Obviously, we all know this is, you know, unprecedented time, not just talking about COVID, but construction in general in the city of Boston. In the last, probably during this last administration, we have seen building go up the trades working, the trickle down of this is enormous throughout the city. It, it, it affects everybody to keep people working, keep people going. Obviously we're gonna talk about the safe manner, but what people have to realize, this is good for you know, the, 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 the investors themselves all the way down to the gentleman on the corner store. What we have at that point, you know, you, you, have, you have people that live in the city, people live outside the city, you know, helping the economy within the city by these people working. You, you go home, you don't worry about, you know, taking, taking your son or your daughter out for a sweatshirt or an ice cream cone. And that's what we look at. And that's, that, that's the way this has to be looked at. Building is good. And I have to say, building in the city of Boston is one of the safest in the country. I'd like to just share with you a little bit of data that I've done a little bit of research on. And once again, ISD, we're, we're, we're a huge role in construction safety in the city of Boston. Well, we have to look at also construction industry. There's so many different entities with, under the umbrella. We have, you know, you have electrical, you have mechanical, you have gas, you have high rise workers, you have steel workers, you have carpenters, you have laborers. So the construction in industry in itself is it's, it's inherently, it can be a dangerous um, industry with all these different trades and all these different moving parts, particularly in some of the, the types of buildings that we have gone up with. But here in ISD, we have building electrical mechanical inspectors. We're all certified by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in regards to the licensing, certifications, and required continuing educational requirements for code upgrades, changes, and policy shift. This ensures the city is safe and effective code officials enforcing the requirements of these various regulations dependent upon national and state requirements, international actually. Our employees are required to undergo OSHA certification and work in conjunction with OSHA officials of national and federal to ensure workplace in the city. Construction industry is one of the most dangerous in the world with fatality rate four times the national average of any other, second only to fishing, the fishing industry. I mean, that's, that's something to be considered. It's ranked just behind the fishing in national statistics into, into fatalities. With this said, Massachusetts is ranked in the top 20% nationally in regards to workplace safety. The enforcement of code and diligence of the inspectors is some of the reasons for this statistic, even among one of the greatest booms within the city of our, within our city. Combined with this effort from local inspectors, the strong presence of union workers in the city 
and the education and awareness that comes with such is the reason why we are far above the national standards and the safety aspect. With the unions comes great training. There's, they're required to have training in, in safety measures in place per their union, not only per federal officials, local officials, but by their own unions. And it's enforced at that level also through all these levels. 2019, just for examples, 3,700 new units were offered in the city, which coincided with nearly 22,000 jobs in the construction industry alone. The city has collected over $61 million in permitting fees in 2019, $11.6 billion in construction currently underway. Boston, in addition to the above, has collected over $80 million in additional revenue from new development. And once again, if we let's take a look throughout the city. A lot of those dollars stay in the city and, and, it, and it goes down to, a, it, it, it helps everybody. At the tragedy with the trench collapse, as the commissioner has touched upon, claiming the lives of two workers, here at ISD with our commissioners, we took the role of the additional responsibility of screening all the permit applicants in regards to their workplace safety records. We reach out to their insurance companies for their insurance ratings. And some of these ratings are gonna be inherently high because of the job, roofers, they're gonna start at a higher rating, but we'll, we'll screen that and we'll look and they're gonna start at a higher rating, but we'll adjust, we have to work with roofers no matter what the rating is, rating is a standard, that's a number, but a roof has to get done. If you have no issues, you have no workplace violations, we're gonna give you that permit to roof and we're gonna monitor that roof and we're gonna monitor you on the roof along with OSHA officials. And the last year, ISD, as the commissioner, as Commissioner Irish has stated, we played a role both reviewing the enforcement of COVID-19 policy and procedure in regards to the workplace. And I have to say that the major contractors, all the con contractors within the city of Boston, they stepped up to the plate. They developed their own policy for review by this department. And if we could, I know it's, it's, it's an impossible milestone to reach, but if we could have traceability to those on construction sites in, in, in regards to spread to COVID, I would venture to say we were probably way below the national average as far as any other spreading of this, of this pandemic goes on work site or from work sites because they're highly monitored by their own. And that's a credit to all these individuals doing the jobs in the city of Boston right now. And if we, and if we have come across individuals, we do have, we, we, enforce, we enforce the COVID-19 policy. We'll stop the job, we'll levy fines. And you know, we're gonna cost you one way or the other. You know, we take it very seriously here and, we, and, we, and we, uh, we back it up. In conclusion, Boston's ranked one of the safest in the nation even at the current time being one of the busy, busiest in the nation with the, cons, cons, the construction that's going on within the city. And obviously, you know, once again, just to reiterate, we need construction in the city. With the, with the, with the weather that we have, there's always gonna be repair, alterations. We have to go forth, we have to go forward. And that's my statement. And uh, I, I give the chair to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner Leiden. Appreciate your comments. And before I introduce the next uh, panelist, I'd like to acknowledge my colleague, City Councilor Mejia has joined us as well as City Councilor Anis Rosabi George has joined us as well. Um, Mr. Ryle Rhodes is a, a, a union leader with the North Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters. Um, and just wanna ask Mr. Rhodes if you would like to provide an opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Flynn, for the invitation uh, to this, and thanks everyone else for being here today. Um, I will be brief. So my name is Ryle Rhodes. Um, I am the business manager of Carpenters Local 327 in the Boston downtown Boston market. Um, and to talk about what we do for as far as safety, um, every member of our organization um, in the downtown Boston, not just downtown Boston, but um, statewide, but we're talking say 4,100 individuals. Um, every single individual has to go through our OSHA training program, which is a two-step process. Um, first, they have to have a 10, a 10 hour OSHA certificate. And then anyone in the supervisory position in our journeyman level, they have to take the 32 hour course. That's mandatory to work on any job site in the city of Boston, which is unlike anywhere else in the country. Um, we take safety uh, very, very uh, seriously. 
and especially in today's market, uh, what's going on out there with the COVID-19. Um, like um, Mr. Lydon said earlier, we actually, we're trying to take that head on on every single job site in the city of Boston, where we don't have people that might come in contact with someone maybe on a job site in the city of Boston and take that home with them. That's the last thing we want to do because, you know, a lot of our workers use the MBTA. Um, it's a transient system, Boston, you know, you can, you can get around that way. And that's the last thing we want to do is, uh, you know, spread the virus anywhere, but everyone's done a great job. I'm telling you the city of Boston's really stepped up um, in this market in construction compared to anyone else in the country. Um, it, it, we really do have a handle on it. And, um, you know, if you go to any job site, it's, you know, you have to check in, temperature, screening, questionnaire, you know, that's masks, the whole nine yards. Um, is it easy? No. Do people like doing it? No. But it's uh, it's a way of life, and that's the way of life it's going to be in the city of Boston going forward. And um, happy to ask any questions, anything I could do to help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Thank you for your leadership, and thank you to the leadership of um, the carpenters and, and so many building trades across our state, um, especially on um, safety in the workplace. It's a critical issue. And I know organized labor is doing an exceptional job um, on, on, that, on that issue among many issues. So I just want to acknowledge, acknowledge that. Um, I have questions, but I'm gonna allow my colleagues to start first and then I'm gonna ask questions maybe at the end but in order of arrival, I'd like to ask Councilor Bach if she would like to begin the uh, Q&A period. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. And thank you uh, to the commissioner and the assistant commissioner um, and also uh, to you, Mr. Rhodes. Um, I guess just one quick question I had was just um, if you could go in a, in a little more detail, um, Assistant Commissioner Leiden, um, about the affidavit system and sort of exactly what came in after um, I very much remember the tragedy with the trench a few years back, just so I can understand sort of how our procedures changed after that. Very well, Council. What it is, it's uh, what's called a Maddox Higgins affidavit, named after the gentleman who did who did perish in the uh, the terrible accident that we did have. What it is basically as an application that happened on the street, as an application for a permit comes into this into this into ISD. What we we require is it's it's a rating given by an insurance company. And we have a cutoff, we have a standard of 1.0. That's our cutoff. And the way it's rated by the insurance companies is the higher the risk job are the infractions that the company itself has. They, 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 they are automatically assigned a higher risk to insure. We ask for that, and we take it in. Once again, you may have individuals or different entities with a higher than a 1.0 risk, which is beyond our cutoff. Now that is further scrutinized. We can go in and we can look at their at their history. And if they do have workplace violations with safety incidents, we can look. And if they do not, say once again, a roofer, for example, or, or, or an iron worker, they're very high, they're high risk. And they are gonna come in automatically to insurance companies at, on, at a higher rating. So we have the ability and the authority to scrutinize that and issue the permit or deny the permit based on that particular rating. Great. Thank you. That's, yeah. that's helpful context. And I, I wondered if you could speak a little bit. I know that the, the immediate tragedy that precipitated Councillor Flynn's um, hearing order today was uh, the person that we lost in the setup for the first night celebrations last year. Um, and, uh, and I, I don't, you know, I'm just, I'm curious sort of what happened there and what we learned from it and whether there was any, were any kind of changes made after the fact, because it was really a, a terrible tragedy. I, I, I can I can speak on that a bit. Basically, what happened there was it, it, it was you know a terrible event, a terrible tragedy, particularly that time to any time. But in setting up a first night and the, the the glee that supposedly surrounds, what happened was it was operator error. It was it was a top heavy load coming off a forklift and it tilted, and uh, it should have never happened. It should have been should have been monitored, monitored more closely by individuals on the unloading of, of, of the, the load was too big for the, for the apparatus that was handling it. 
And that's the unfortunate bottom line. Got it. And, and there isn't, I mean, it was sort of in violation of existing procedures. So there isn't something that we could sort of change in response to it is that's what I'm hearing. It's, it was, it was in violation of the maximum load on the, on, mm -hmm. on, that's recommended for the lift itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just such a tragedy. And the, and the, and the, the angle coming down, the angle where it's coming down. Yeah. Um, and and I know we've had a few in the last few years, I've, I've been aware of a bunch of um, fires we've had of nearly completed buildings. Um, and I, I don't think any of those, um, I think, I don't think any of those has taken any workers lives. They've mostly gotten started while people are off the job. But I just wonder if um, that's my, my impression as a civilian is that I feel like I've seen a lot of that in the last few years, but I don't know. Um, whether that's sort of true from a trend perspective and whether there's anything ISD is doing about that and just thinking about the fire aspects of worker safety here. I can address that a little bit. Um, let's, we'll go back to Ashmont. The Ashmont, the, um, obviously just almost completed. Once again, it was installation. Um, they had completed a generator pre-test that morning and the generator, the, the exhaust on it, the clearance was not the correct clearance on the surroundable, surrounding combustibles on that particular unit. And that was, uh, that was strictly in, I mean, once again, the installation was not correct. And obviously huge loss, thankfully no lives lost. What I would like to focus on, if we look back throughout, through building code, we've actually greatly reduced the amount of fatalities, first and foremost, or great, great bigger fires. Whenever we're, we're gonna take, let's take a, a standard three decker, for example. You know, obviously, you know, very high demand throughout the city right now. It's a huge real estate market. Investors are, some, if you take a three family dwelling in, in, in the city right now, and you intend to completely rehab that through ISD, through building code, you're required now, you're gonna have to sprinkle that building. And you're also gonna have to bring it up to current code as far as your different fire stopping on levels. You're gonna contain that fire most more effectively than any time in history right now. And if there are fires, what's happening is they're contained, you know, and that's credit to the fire department, obviously, with the quick response, but also through building code. You're going to have to encapsulate that particular unit or that particular room. A fire is going to look for oxygen. It, it will find no place to find that additional oxygen to creep up behind what they call balloon framing in these particular instances. And also with the fire alarms, you're going to have the installation of a fire alarm in a three-family house or new construction, three-family house. The response is there from the fire department immediately. And once again, the sprinkler system, that's going to buy time. And that saves lives. And that's huge. That's huge in Massachusetts State Building Code and city ordinances right now. It's huge. And we're very, very focused on that. And the, and the incidence of fire and fatalities and, and um, injuries greatly reduced on any kind of rehabbed project in the city. Well, that's, that's great to hear. Um, and my last quick question is, um, before I go back to the chairman is just, um, for you or for Mr. Rhodes, I know, you know, throughout the city, and I should say this is not at all um, just construction sites, it's everywhere. Um, we definitely hear as counselors when we don't have perfect compliance with mask wearing, um, you know, and, and folks are home and sometimes they see job sites and they say, you know, it's a little, it's getting a little um, loose. Um, and, and I think, you know, we all know it's a hard thing to get used to and it's a hard thing to get used to when you're out doing work. Um, but I just wonder if either of you could speak a little bit to kind of, um, measures to really encourage full compliance on that front? Because it is something that I would say I get fairly regular calls about right now. Yeah, I'll speak about one job in particular. I was there two days ago. That's the West End Garage, uh, the Tishman Project over in North Station. Um, there was um, a, a lot of complaints because it's a very tight neighborhood over there in the West End. Um, there's a few places, there's one restaurant in, in particular, Apache's, I believe it's right there. And um, when you put 200 construction workers in, uh, dump them into one place, they're going to want to eat somewhere. And, and a lot of people were, uh, a lot of workers were, you know, walking from the site to the restaurant without a mask on and in grouping out on the lawn area, the green area. Um, but that's one project we've kind of... Um, you know, we we spent a I've spent a few couple of days myself just over there talking to the guys, tell them to spread out, get away from each other, make sure they have the mask on, especially when they're in the neighborhoods, 
because that's the last thing we want to do. Like I said before, we don't want something from a job site to filter into the neighborhood. Um, but a lot of these companies that are operating in the city are, you know, they really take it serious. And if you're not wearing a mask, you know, there's no tolerance, you're out. And um, just an, another, just to talk about one other thing about the um, the fires and the some of the construction sites. Um, in the city of Boston, if you're on a major construction site, you have to have a hot work permit now. The worker does, each individual worker. So if I'm operating a tool that might send off some kind of spark or um, help with it, it could combust with any kind of material, we have to know the safety precautions around about that. And that's uh, another thing a lot of places in the country don't have, except for the city of Boston. And that goes for every individual from a first year apprentice to someone with 25 years in the business. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks for going down to the uh, West End Garage Project. That's definitely one of the ones I hear about. And then I don't know if it's your, if it's, uh, your folks are involved in it, but I've been hearing a bit on 411 Park up in Fenway. Um, just so we're, you know. 411 just, Park, well, I'm trying to think of the job. Um, is that the, the Landmark Center? Oh, the Landmark Center. That's not in the Boston. That's not really considered in the Boston um, market for us. That's actually... Um, Cambridge, but it's we're all under the same umbrella. Well, no, 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 it's 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 Boston. Yeah, it. no, it's it is Boston. Oh, Cambridge. your lines, I got yeah, it, I got it. You know, the lines <laughs> in the sand for us. I don't know who got made it. them up. Nope. Um, I consider, believe it or not, they consider like um, certain jobs on the other side of the river, Boston. I say that's not Boston, that's Cambridge. I consider the water their line, but they do they've stolen a few a little area from us um, over the years, but. That's another project that um, I can pass the word along, though, today, definitely, and say, you know, you might have to have someone go over and talk to someone. I do it all the time. I do it every, I just left the seaport this morning before this meeting started. Um, me and another rep, we did a, we did a few of the uh, job sites just to make sure the guys were wearing the masks and stuff like that. It went, it went pretty well so far. Great. Really appreciate that. And yeah, and everybody's human and we're all trying to just, you know, manage this thing as best we can. No, any if if anything comes up in your area, just contact Mr. Flynn, and um, he has my contact, and I'll do it myself. You know, and I don't, I won't call ten people. I'll do it myself. You know, anything I can do to help. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Block. Um, next up is quickly. is um, Councillor Mejia. Um, Yes, I believe Commissioner Irish wanted to say something before I go, so I heard. I him. just wanted to remind folks that you could also. Um, Call through in one, let us know. We'll get an inspector out there to address the issue as well. Thank you, Commissioner Irish. Um, Councilor Mejia. Yes, uh, thank you, um, Chairman Flynn um, and the administration for being here. I only have a few questions and you should be um, ready to go. Um, my questions are, um, construction workers make up the largest percent of um, uninsured workers. And I'm just curious, what are we doing to ensure that if they get sick due to COVID or other reasons that they're not missing out on critical pay? Uh, as far as us, as far as the union goes, um, that's one of the biggest fights we have today in the city of Boston is undocumented workers. And some people do not like to recognize the fact that that goes on, but it goes on every day in the city of Boston. And um, it's rampant in the residential area, um, not as much as in the commercial area, but it's rampant in the residential commercial, uh, residential construction area, it's rampant. Um, you know, years ago when I first got in, like uh, years ago, I'll say 30 years ago, um, we used to have to watch, we used to say, we used to have to shut the door from the north because we thought everyone was coming down from New Hampshire to work in the city of Boston. Well, that's not true anymore. It, it's it's totally flipped in New Bedford, Fall River, Rhode Island. Um, it's like the 95 corridor. And um, it's one thing, that's one of the biggest fights we have to this day in the city of Boston is that. Um, we're trying, we try as an organization every day, but it's, it's a, it's a tough battle. You know, it's a tough battle. Okay. So then I'm curious in terms of a follow-up 
I'm wondering in terms of safety protocols, um, I'm just curious as to whether or not there are any other languages aside from English that are um, shared in some of these construction sites. Oh yeah, we have, you know, the carpenters, we have probably nine full-time bilingual um, people that work for us in the community. Um, so what we do, say, say if they go to a, a job site and we get word that um, a company is not paying an individual or what, what happens a lot of times, not to, to make this a big prod thing, is um, they have, say, um, say Ed Flynn Drywall gets the job at a housing complex in Dorchester. Then Ed Flynn gets the job and he's the subcontractor. He'll subcontract the work out to Don Irish Drywall and Sean Lydon Drywall and Ryle Rhodes Drywall. So there's all kinds of steps uh, of undocumented workers that are on that site. You know what I mean? And if we hear that someone's not getting paid, we'll go to that job site and we'll put, you know, we'll bring it to the light of everyone in the neighborhood. We'll try to get the press involved, TV involved. We'll do everything we can to get those individuals paid, documented or not. If, if they're going to work every day, they should get paid. You know what I mean? That I mean, that's the, you know, there's no harm, you know, and then we try to help them if they have questions is trying to go through the process of being a being documented. I mean, that's a, that's a long process, but we try to do the best we can to help them. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that answer. I, I didn't, that was additional information that I did not ask about, but I'm glad that you answered it. And I really do appreciate you um, helping our audience who are tuning in, understand the efforts that you are, are making um, to support um, workers, workers' rights. You know, I think it's really important. I'll just say really quick, you know, my mom is 71 years old and because she's never had union representation, she's too poor to retire, right? Um, and she's been working in the same place. And even though we tried to unionize um, the, in the space that she was working in, the employee, the, some of the employees were too scared. Um, and so now, you know, my mom is still working. And I, and, I, and I so much appreciate labor and all that you do to protect workers. And so really do appreciate uh, you being here today. And I just have one more question. And I'm just curious about where uh, these accidents and the breach of safety protocols um, that we were talking about earlier are occurring um, most. I'm just curious if there's any way to find out if it's the same company, um, you know, do we have problem actors, people who are not adhering uh, to the rules that we need to just pay super close attention to? Is this information documented somewhere where we can keep track um, from the companies who continue to be bad actors and not follow safety protocols? And this one is for Commissioner Irish. Thanks, Councillor. And, and I will be asking um, Sean just to join in because he may have additional details, but um, to my knowledge, there, um, there aren't any like recurring bad actors I would say um, when I first um, took the helm in June of 2019, we had that incident on Atlantic Ave. Um, it was a roofing company. Um, we looked at all the other sites that they were working on and we, we actually pulled permits for all their sites. So we, we, we shut them down literally. Um, but aside from that, Sean, are there any other recurring? Because I, I know there's a one-off issue here and there, but I'm, I'm not aware of any um, chronic offenders. Chronic offenders, uh, it's a so I can honestly say that it doesn't reach a stage of chronic offenders in the city of Boston because our staff here, you know who's, you know who, you know who the unsafe, you know people are and the 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 people not following protocol and not we find unpermitted jobs we shut it down and as the commissioner said spoken you know the very unfortunate incident on Atlantic Avenue we acted immediately in conjunction with OSHA the job we shut down we did you know pursue I mean the gentleman that in it happened and it was very unfortunate accident. Once again, there was error. All protocol was in place and it was actually a safety railing required that came off the roof and hit that young lady. Very sad. And, um, but we did once again, in conjunction with the state, we pursued, you know, the company responsible and we did act accordingly. But I can honestly say that it, it rarely gets to the point here, permitting wise, it's not gonna get to the point where we have repeat offenders and dangerous individuals operating. If we do, we shut them down. And if, if there's highly, very rare that there is unpermitted or permitted work with unsafe 
conditions going on around the city on a repeat offenders. I can honestly say that. And that that's that's a great point, Sean, because um, actually there, there's some folks who can't even get a permit from us. Um, I mean, there's, no, there's not a database on it, but we know certain contractors who we've had issues with and they're not able to get permits. Sean makes sure that that doesn't happen. That's great. That's right. And my last question, I know we're talking about big projects here, Councillor Flynn, but, and maybe this may not be the right place for this question, but I'm curious for the smaller uh, mom and pop shops, like, you know, landlords, just, there are a lot of people who don't even know about the, the process of having to go through permitting and, and, and hiring licensing individuals, like, Commissioner Irish, I think that, you know, there, there needs to be more education in the community about why it's so important to ensure that you are hiring professionals who are licensed um, and more information about what, whether if you're just fixing your deck or something, that people need to know that these things need to be permitted. And we take, there's a lot of privilege in this space that we think that everybody knows things, but I know a lot of people, y'all out there that are doing things that they don't even know that they're supposed to be doing because they didn't know about it. And so I'm not snitching, but I'm just letting you know that y'all need to stop putting some information out here because these people, they're out here doing things that they're not supposed to be doing because they didn't know that they were doing it. No, that's an excellent point, Counselor. Um, that is something that's needed. That's something that we're gonna do. That I mentioned a um, few months ago, seems like last year, at our budget hearing, we talked about some of the initiatives that we had planned around public education, around construction safety and building safety. Well, unfortunately, we didn't get to do it this year, but it is on our agenda for next year, and we'll make sure it's as robust as possible to address the things that you just brought up. Thank you. And, and in multiple languages, because you know some of these folks don't speak English, so. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, th thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. And I especially enjoyed the back and forth with, with Mr. Rhodes on, on wage theft issues. And that's a huge concern in my district, especially in the, in the restaurant businesses as well. Mm -hmm. I see it a lot. I worked closely with um, Community Labor United, with Darlene Lombos, and with the Chinese Progressive Association but I'm still seeing, unfortunately seeing that in many restaurants, but we, have, we as a city have zero tolerance for um, any worker that doesn't get paid. And I'm, I'm very glad to hear the comments from Mr. Rhodes as well. He feels the same way. Anyone that works a day, works a full day should get a full day's pay. Um, and that's what the union is all about is fighting for, fighting for workers. So thank you, it was a very, informative conversation both of you had. So thank you, Council Mahir and Councilor Rhodes. Um, sorry to digress a little bit, um, but I'd like to introduce or recognize my counselor, my colleague, Councilor Anissa Rasabi George. Thank you, uh, Chair Flynn, and thank you everyone for being here and participating in this conversation. Looking at the hearing order for today, um, this was filed around sort of the more traditional safety uh, concerns and measures that we undertake as a city and need to continue being vigilant about. Um, but we know that since uh, the pandemic and really since March and April, a lot of the safety conversations have changed. So I just want to appreciate the work that ISD has done and uh, Commissioner Irish and uh, his team and, and Sean's group, um, as well as all of our <laughs> construction operators and um, unions across the city and the very proactive uh, effort they've made in making sure that we're protecting workers and um, visitors to job sites across the city uh, during the, the pandemic and thinking about uh, controlling this uh, very infectious disease. So I just want to give that moment of um, appreciation. I am curious, and, and some of this has been covered in uh, the questions both by uh, Councillor Bach and Councillor Mejia around the changes in the way that we approach our work um, in creating safe environments uh, because of COVID. And, and obviously we don't wanna lose our focus on maintaining sort of the physical safety aspects of our job sites, but recognizing uh, that we do need to respond now to COVID. Who at the, um, so I'm curious about just some of the general um, shifts in, in job site management briefly, and then also the role that OSHA 
and uh, the CDC may play in making sure that those pieces are in place as well. I can just, if I could, I could just, um, I'm not an expert on all of it, but I can tell you this, OSHA is um, overworked and underfunded, that's for sure. Um, I don't think they have enough um, field reps. Um, you know, they're kind of like the last person you want to call is, the, is someone from OSHA. Um, like, I don't, I, 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 I never liked even talking to someone from, oh, well, you know, it's nice if you run into someone that works for them, you talk to them. But um, even like if we have a problem with the um, uh, unsightly contractor, we try to deal with them one-on-one. -on -one. OSHA really doesn't do anyone any good because um, they'll come in and, you know, they'll look for uh, extension cords that are busted and they won't really, you know, they, they, they like I said, they're over man, they're overworked and they're underpaid. And if they really had the teeth, I think uh, it would be great. But um, we, we do a lot better calling the city of Boston ourselves, ISD and in a rep or something like that. And we, you know, it, we get a we, we get our point a lot better that way. You know what I mean? And it, it, even if the pro, you know, the, honestly, if a project, you know, we saw a union, we see non-union, union, non-union, non the project has to get built. Um, and and if it's if it's going, it's just going. The, like, let, let's get the end. Let's get the best we can for the neighborhood. And um, you know, this I think the city of Boston has done a better job, ten times better than OSHA could ever do. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that endorsement, and I'm certain that the commissioner does as well. We do. Thank you. No problem. Great. And, and any other, any other, I you know, sort of changes that we've seen in, um, in the, both the workload because this has been a significant shift. Um, when we think about safety, that still remains paramount. That physical safety piece, but now we're dealing with uh, the protocols that are put in place and probably will be in place for the foreseeable future. Um, how has that changed sort of the workload at ISD and um... yep. so we, we've definitely seen an increase in workload um, you know prior to um, reopening construction we consulted with public health officials CDC our public health commission to develop protocols to ensure that um, that we could educate the construction work um, workers to provide plans to us so that they could operate safely once we allowed them to reopen. Um, so now, um, among other things that we ask for, because one of the things you'll find contractors um, in the city of Boston, we ask them for probably many more things than, than other communities do in order for them to get a permit. So we want their Matters Higgum affidavit. We want their, uh, now they have to provide a COVID safety plan. That re requires an additional review for us now. And, and sometimes some additional back and forth between us and applicants which slows down the process and it does create more work, but it's, it's it, the most important thing is public health and public safety. So that has added an additional review for us. Also, we, we've um, done extensive trainings for our inspectors to, um, so that they can have a better eye towards the public health protocols that now need to be in place on job sites. So now that's an additional thing that inspectors are looking for on job sites. Um, with respect to um, how busy things are. Um, we are seeing a, we're not seeing any drop off in permit requests. And I, I think we're probably busier now than we were before. And we're doing our permit applications, our reviews, it's all remote now. Our inspections are in person, but everything else, all the other parts of the process is now being done remotely, which does have some communication challenges and has required us to, um, to do a lot more education and a lot more outreach. Uh, with folks seeking permits for variety, for whatever reason. Um, so I want to just take an opportunity just to remind folks that they should visit our website. We have a, a COVID informational page that explains how you can access everything that you need to access from ISD, whether it's through our permitting process or any other part of ISD. There's, um, there are new ways and modified ways for you to get, for you to get services from ISD. So visit our, our page at... Um, cityofboston.gov and visit the ISD informational COVID-19 webpage. If I could just jump in. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, please. I'm sorry. Just, uh, I would hate to be sitting there where um, ISD is because these COVID plans are so, you know, 
every single company has a different COVID plan and a different way to deal with it. And it's, um, we just went through a little training yesterday on, on, you know, what happens when someone actually gets COVID or gets sent home with it or uh, who's responsible for paying him? Does he get paid? Does he not get paid? And tracing and all that. I mean, it, you have a hands full. I, I give you, you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. I'm all set, Mr. Chair. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Sabi George. I'm going to ask my questions now. I don't um, see any other colleagues here. Um, I just have two questions. Um, I'll start with uh, Mr. Rhodes. Mr. Rhodes, when, when a young person starts off in the apprenticeship program, can you talk about the safety training that person would receive as an apprenticeship and then each step moving up until he becomes um, you know, fully certified? And is that training all continued um, you know, even to this day? Yeah, absolutely. So when um, say, say you come off the streets of Boston, and you know, totally nothing like myself when I did uh, 33 years ago, I'm, I'm kind of aging myself. Yeah. Um, I walked in, I didn't know what a hammer was uh, to compare to a screwdriver. Uh, but I just knew this, I could make 525 an hour compared to the 425 I was making. So I said, Oh, this is a good move. Um, so right when they start, they get a general overview of the whole program and what it takes to be a carpenter, what it's going to be like, what the future holds, and all the things that they have to they have to do. Uh, it's a two-way street. There's the training part and then there's the applied part on the job site. Um, with their first time, um, they go to the training center. Um, they do a whole uh, week of just basic training. It's like a basic uh, safety training about tools, how to dress, how to act, how to protect their eyes, their, you know, hard hat safety, gloves, uh, working conditions, how to stay safe in certain working conditions. Outside is different than inside, of course. Um, heights, um, they'll be introduced to, um, you know, the different types of equipment they might use on a big, large scale, like um, aerial lifts, um, and then they'll be introduced to um, their personal protective equipment, um, their harnesses. So when they're lift, you know, climbing anytime the scaffold, um, you have to get certified in the scaffold. Um, it's pretty, it's a lot the first time. So that's why they kind of, they kind of go, it's spread out over four years. Um, you know, the first time is like a general um, addition just to keep them safe make sure they go home with the 10 fingers in you know every, what they went to work with um, safety on the saws uh, any kind of power tool they can touch uh, when you're a first year apprentice that's what you really have to be safe about um, a lot of accidents happen that way you know um, and the other thing is just general like um, safety of a person as far as carrying certain things uh, on a in a building like uh, how to walk upstairs with equipment, um, stuff. All that training is like maybe the first year, um, and then uh, the at the second time at school, it's like probably after the first six months they do their OSHA um, ten. Uh, OSHA ten is like it comes right from the federal government. Those standards, um, everyone has to do that. But then by the time they graduate, every single kid should have a thirty-two hour OSHA card in their pocket which is pretty much covers it all. There's one other certificate above that. It's 500 hours, which is, you know, I don't think anyone, uh, normal guy will have that certificate walking around. Um, it's a long journey, you know, it's a long journey. Every, and then not just um, the training they receive at the school, um, they're going to they're gonna require job specific training because every job is different. They might be on a high rise, um, they might be down in the tunnel. They might be uh, on the MBTA tunnel working at night. Um, there's all kinds of hazards out there. And uh, every job and every contractor uh, that is signatory to the union has a specific uh, safety plan in place. Um, it, so it's it's pretty rigorous. Um, you know, that's the best I could do right now. No, th thank you, Mr. Rhodes. And um, 
my final question um, to Commissioner Irish or to Assistant Commissioner Leiden. Um, just from my experience over the last year or so, what's, what's your advice, recommendation, or, um, or opinion? We often see construction sites in dense neighborhoods, but the the construction, you know, scaffolding or the equipment, oftentimes is in, in the middle of the sidewalk. Um, I know, I know, inspectors will come out from ISD, but what 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 can we learn from that, or how can we how can we deal with that situation um, the best we can, knowing that safety and um, health. Uh, the number one priorities for us. If I may, address that, Commissioner, please. Actually, Councillor, if you call ISD, ISD, we will have an inspector out there promptly. Once again, but we have what we have to look at. We have to consider the job site itself. If 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 equipment has to be loaded onto that site, we have to. They have to cross the sidewalk. They have to, and then. What we're looking at, okay, DPW permits, perhaps police detail to get that equipment and all the stock mm -hmm. in and off the site. There, there will be obviously a limited time and that will be done in an efficient manner. That's our job. When it, nothing's, nothing's to hang around on the sidewalk, nothing, uh, nothing unsafe or dangerous, unless there is, it's required, you know, just because they're working on the specific elevation of the building itself, that has to be there. Otherwise, if it is anybody feels it's an unsafe situation or it's been ongoing for too long, Call us. We will address it, and we will address it with the contractor and other homeowner. Yeah. Th thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And my final question, maybe as a follow-up, um, with the with the construction site in a, in a neighborhood, if the if the company if the company has done work for the weekend on a Friday afternoon, they're going to come back Monday, or they might come back a week later. What is the protocol for making sure that? You know the 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 equipment that's still there is secure, um, is 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 safe. Um, the 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 company might not take down the equipment, but how do we know that the equipment that they're leaving there over the weekend or maybe even a couple of weeks is safe in a residential neighborhood? I may once again. That's the responsibility of the of of the company itself. And what we have to consider too, that equipment is very expensive and, and costly and the liability. So 99.9% .9 of the cases, they're gonna make sure that their lift, it's, it's non-accessible and uh, to any individual. And obviously, you know, nothing is fail safe. We've had some incidents where, you know, people have climbed lifts and with tragedy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for the most part, the job site is required to be secured, fenced, locked and uh, no access to that site, you know, but once again, you know, we can't, it's 99.9% .9 for the most part. And it, the liability, the responsibility is up to the individual contractor and or the homeowner. And nobody wants their tools stolen. Nobody wants their, their lifts vandalized or anything like that. So and for the most part, it's well taken care of. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. I was joined by my colleague, um, City Councilor Michael Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty, um, we're finishing up here with questions, but do you want to um, weigh in with uh, a couple questions. No, just happy to be here. I've joined for a little bit listening to the conversation. Clearly support uh, the chair's efforts to make sure that we have uh, good, sound, secure uh, construction sites. Um, you think about a lot of our construction companies are great partners for our city, particularly during the economic boom that we had experienced. And they were also our partners uh, during uh, and throughout COVID. So just want to make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, working towards the same goal, which is to continue to move Boston forward. Uh, make sure that uh, construction sites, uh, particularly those that are in the neighborhoods, uh, remain safe and uh, accident-free. And then also uh, make sure that uh, the workers, obviously, that are, that are going on to those sites, uh, the men and women of our, our, the, the labor force and, and the construction trades are also um, you know, uh, on safe uh, working conditions as well. So highly regulated industry, of course, uh, OSHA and others that are constantly uh, managing and reviewing um, you know, protocols and and policies on the construction sites, but uh, always good every once in a while to sort of have a, a quality control check, uh, which uh, is my sense as to what you're looking to do here as the chair. And obviously we'll continue to support those efforts. So to the construction partners that are uh, that are here and, and listening in, uh, we continue to uh, look forward to working together. They, they add tremendous value to our city as we continue to see, you know, uh, buildings come up out of the ground and uh, 
you think about we best of those colleges, universities, and a hospital and network of community health centers. And, um, you know, Boston is a, is a safe and livable city. People want to come here. And uh, it's the partnership we have with the, uh, the construction companies and the building trades that are, uh, are, are a big part of that success. So I appreciate uh, those that are participating and listening in and, uh, and look forward to working with you as the chair. Thank you, Council Flynn. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. We are also joined by City Council President Kim Janey. Um, Councilor Janey, would you like to ask any questions before we, uh, before we end? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm joining uh, a little late here. I wanna appreciate you. Thank you for your leadership on this issue, uh, not just as chair of the committee, but as someone who cares deeply for workers in our city. I wanna thank the panel. I look forward to reviewing um, the, the hearing to find out what more we can do around safety. Um, I think there are additional conversations we need to have in terms of wage theft and again, making sure that our workers are protected. I wanna thank you again for your leadership. Thank this panel and thank my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council President. Um, I, would also, I would also like to ask if there's any public testimony um, from the from the general public, I don't believe we we have any. But let me check with um, Shane or Kerry. Um, that's right, Mr. Shane, Chair. Sorry, that's right, Mr. Chair. No, uh, no one signed up for public testimony. No one signed up for public testimony. Excellent. And um, before I before we depart, um, I just want to say thank you to the panelists for being here. For Commissioner Dion Irish, Assistant Commissioner Sean Lydon. Mr. Ryle Rhodes, I know the, the mayor's office as well. My colleagues um, are also here. I wanna say thank you for the tremendous um, information that you provided the general public to, to ISD team and to Mr. Rhodes. And as chair of the city and neighborhood services, I especially like to work on the nuts and bolts of city government issues and to be informative. So it's informative to the public I know we had a hearing commissioner and assistant commissioner uh, recently on pest control, um, on illegal dumping. We have one coming up on um, the workings of the water and sewer. And so it's the, these issues on safety, but they aren't, aren't sexy, but they impact the quality of life of residents and of, of so many people across the city. So I wanna say thank you to the ISD team for their professionalism working with the residents, but also using this as an opportunity to educate the public as well, because I think that's also part of our job. Um, having said that, I'm, I'm so proud to represent District 2. Uh, we have a lot of ongoing construction that is taking place in my district, and I'm proud of the workers that are there helping build a strong economy and making sure that safety, safety protocols are part of that strong economy. And so I want to say thank you to um, Mr. Ryle Rhodes from the Carpenters Union. I want to say thank you to the, the other building trades that, are, that we deal with, that we work with, and uh, say thank you to the ISD team. Again, I want to say thank you to my central um, city council, central staff, Kerry and Shane, for helping us on today's meeting. With that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.